Our affair is clearer than that. The confusion is because of other things. If you've clarified, if you've gained that knowledge, if you've made sure your information of the religion is strongly founded, you cannot be shaken on that. And the second part, practice. Practice. A lot of times we realize to an extent what the truth is, but we go against it. This is where the, the real problem is. Some people go against it because they start following the wrong people. But sometimes we go against it knowing that it's right and we still go against it. That's because of action. That's because of sins. That's because we didn't follow what we were supposed to. And sometimes for the sinful, God forbid, during that time, things become more ambiguous and unclear. Okay, if more questions arise on this, I'll explain what I mean by that. Yes, brother? I haven't watched the whole thing, the Arrival series. I haven't watched the whole thing. But uh, what I did watch, it's not all strongly founded. Some of it is in our books. Some of it isn't very strongly founded. The ideology of Wilayatul Faqih, is that related to the coming of our Imam? Is it not? One thing is for us to understand is one of the areas that our information is not very accurate, not very strongly founded, is about the general concept of government in Islam. Whether it's the government of the Imams, the government of the Holy Prophet, or the government of Faqih. Okay. We have very limited knowledge on that. What is the government of the Holy Prophet about? How does the Holy Prophet talk about government? What's the point of the government of the Holy? Why does the Holy Prophet have government in the first place? Why is there a fight about who takes control of that government after the Holy Prophet? Look, remember, the dispute that Amir al muminin had with the Khulafa about, or what it was about after the Holy Prophet, wasn't about his Imamah. He was an Imam. If everybody on the face of the earth would have gotten against him, the Imamah is still there. Okay. Doesn't change the status of the Imam. What happened, one of the dimensions of the Imamah is government. The debate, the discussion, the fight that the lady Fatima to Zahra had to put her life on it was about government and who leads that government is it just anybody the Muslims just it doesn't matter Islam doesn't talk of no government you know it's dirty stuff it's politics don't do it is that what let's understand as I said let's leave aside Wilayatul Faqih let's talk about Wilayat of the Holy Prophet that's where our understanding is flawed. What is the wilayah of the Holy Prophet? What is the wilayah of Amir al muminin What is the wilayah of Imam al mujtaba and the rest of the Imams? Is the wilayah of them having love for them? Is the wilayah of the Ahlul Bayt considering them Imams? Well, it's a much grander concept. I would say this is an area that you need to understand more and more about. If we want to talk about the concept itself, that's one thing. Is it related to co the coming of the Imam of our time? I think there is relevance to it. Okay. The relevance is a couple of things. First of all, learning how to identify a true leader that is going to lead you and practicing this, brothers and sisters, practicing this. Following a leader in your social political lives is not as easy as you think it is. All right. People came to the door of Amir al-Mu'mini after 25 years and said, Amir al-Mu'mini, we want your justice, we want you. They said that, didn't they? They wanted that, didn't they? But there's a difference between wanting that and being able to take it. Okay. There's a difference between that. 
being able to follow instructions from the right source because by the way if you don't follow it from the right source you're going to be following it from the wrong source all right it's not like you don't have government you don't accept the leadership of anyone it's about whose leadership it is we're doing that if we take a look at our lives there is relevance to it okay the relevance is understanding the concept of Islamic government the role of Islam in social political life understanding that correctly okay understanding how to identify a pious leader from one that is not that's going to again help us out in identifying who the Imam is and following that instruction and the other relevance of it that can be considered a relevance is understanding the idea behind the occultation itself and learning that the occultation is not about the Imam or the people waiting on their Imam it's about the Imam waiting on, their pe on his people the people need to be ready for that where does that readiness come from? how does that happen? What we've heard about the time of the occultation and this, the, the earth is going to be filled with injustice, what does that exactly mean? Does that mean all the people of the world are going to turn evil and then all of a sudden the Imam is going to arrive and then somehow automatically you're going to become religious? Is that how it's going to happen? If that wanted to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have done, He wouldn't have taken the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen like that. He would have done it with Amir al-Mu'mineen. The entire world, all of a sudden, abracadabra, everybody's Muslim. If that was supposed to happen, it would have, if everybody in, in the world is more corrupt than the Juhal at the time of the Holy Prophet, then why, the, why did Allah keep him for this time? If it's about a miracle happening, that could have happened a long time ago. What's the logic behind it? That's not the point. Okay. There's going to be more corruption. There's going to be more oppression. But oppression has got two sides to it. An oppressor and an oppressed. When you have more oppression, you're going to have more oppressed people as well. Okay? And these oppressed people have got to learn more and start moving in the right direction. When the masses are ready, that's when the Imam can come and lead them. Okay? In what we see in today's history, this concept, the practice of it, the leadership of Imam Khomeini, the leadership of Ayatollah Khamenei is leading in this direction. Look at what has happened over just the course of 30 years. Okay, a little over 30 years. This is what, it was not only a revolution in the borders, within the borders of Iran. It was a revolution that had global implications. Okay. And you're currently seeing some of those implications in the region over there. And you'll continue seeing that. And that itself has a domino's effect. You think that the revolution did not play a role in what's happening in Europe? It has a domino's effect. When you see the people in the Middle East starting to rise up, all right, the slogans that are chanted in Europe are similar. They're saying the same things. Okay. And this is going to continue. So yes, it is re related and it is relevant. I saw a few hands. Yes. Yeah? Sorry, Dara. Um, the boys back when I are okay. going to proceed upstairs. For those of you who want to stay, obviously you can stay. For those of you who want to go to the boys back there, please proceed to the men's hall. And just a reminder for the ladies to please remain downstairs and not go upstairs. And for everybody else, I mean, there's no you know, program that I think please, you know, Recite a salawat, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajah. Yes. Alaykum as salam. I'm sorry, there's a little bit of racket here. I'm not hearing you. If you could either wait a little bit until they go out or... If we can, uh, if you can speak up a bit so I can hear that. Okay, I think they left. Go ahead, sister. Uh, so you, uh, you spoke about uh, oppression and injustice and how that would fill the world before the Holy Imam. Yes. I was also being told how the Holy Imam will come to spread truth and justice and alleviate the oppression and injustice. That's right. So do you think that as Muslims and as people who are waiting to be Imam, it is befitting of us to uh, address the issues of oppression and injustice in our everyday life? Thank you. 
It's a very good question about, uh, well, I was gonna actually uh, change a word in, in what you had said and you changed it yourself. Is it befitting, you started with, for the Muslims to discuss issues related to oppressions around us, where we live, right here in Toronto, for example, okay. And there were examples that, we, that were mentioned. And then she changed the word to responsibility. I wanted to say that most definitely it's a responsibility of the believers to stand up against injustice. There's a verse in the Holy Quran. It describes the believers. It says, الَّذِينَ إِن مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةِ there may be a couple of words there that I'm skipping, but then okay. The believers have this quality. If they have the liberty in an area, the Ahlul Bayt at times did not have the liberty to express even religious rulings of how wudu is done. But the, the moment or the second they had the opportunity and the liberty to say something or do something. A lot of times they couldn't say anything, they did it. Okay. About oppressions, they would do it. The people of Medina, the Ansar, gradually became the poor people in Medina by the time of Imam al Sadiq. You hear the stories of the Imam carrying food for these people. These are the oppressed people of Medina. He can't say too much, but at night, late at night, he takes it. We say, oh, he didn't want people to see him, all of that. There could be a political issue there as well. Because if people knew that the Imam is doing that, it could cause problems for him. I'm saying the verse says, anytime believers have the opportunity and the liberty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides that for them. If it's there, then they fulfill these responsibilities. Aqamu salah is social. And I'll get back to this because the examples that the sister mentioned are related to the Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar. I'll get back to the Salat, which is also very important. Aqamu Salat is a social responsibility. Atu Zakat is a social responsibility because Aqamu Salat is not just facing the Qibla saying Allahu Akbar. Aqamu Salat is upholding the prayer in the society, in your family, in your community, and so on and so forth. Atu Zakat, even more clear. Amaru bil Ma'ruf and Nahi they will be telling those who are not fulfilling their responsibility hey it's your job why aren't you doing this for those who are oppressing others you've got to tell them don't and stop it and take action against it this is a responsibility okay. we can't say that we are awaiting the coming of the imam and we're not doing anything right now. At your ability, what you have, the capabilities that you have, the freedom and liberty that you have to practice this, you have to do it. Then you can say, I'm ready for the Imam to come. Otherwise, we're not ready for the Imam to come. This is very obvious. Okay. And it is very important. Now, a lot of times, there's these global problems that are very serious issues, okay? And we talk about them as well. But we talk about them as symbols of injustice. When today was the Friday, last Friday of the month of Ramadan, it was Yom Al-Quds. Okay. The day of Quds. The day of Quds is standing up and rising against the clearest example of oppression on the face of the earth. People coming in, destroying a land, kicking its people out, killing the people, okay? taking that line, establishing a state, and just nobody is even accepting that there was such a thing called Palestine, all right? Or accepting that there needs, these people need to be consulted. And then worst of all is that this is all under the banner of democracy. This is one of the worst forms of oppression that you can find. But this is a symbol, okay? This is not the only oppression that happens. There's oppressions that happen locally and we're responsible for. The examples that were mentioned about bottled water, where it comes from, some of these companies, they go and 
subjugate people, get them to work long hours, not give them enough, they starve them, and all kinds of stuff that they've done in Africa and different regions of the world, maybe even South America in some parts, okay? And they're constantly doing this. This is oppression. We've got to be more aware of this, and we've got to take st uh, steps towards trying to resolve the problem as much as we, what we can do, all right? We may not, and we won't be able to do, you know, get rid of all these problems, but we've got to do our share, okay? But what I want to say is that there's another responsibility as well. There's another form of oppression that a lot of times we don't even consider oppression. And for us, we got to be careful with this one and make sure we fulfill our responsibilities. Because this is the worst form of oppression that the Imam is going to be removing from the face of the earth. I'll give you two verses in the Holy Quran. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تشرك بالله إن الشرك لظلم عظيم. Disbelief in God, believing in other deities, disbelief in His religion, in His prophet, that is oppression. ظلم عظيم. It's a great oppression. All right. Another verse. The people in Medina, the Holy Prophet had an expedition, people going and looking out for what the mushrikeen are doing close to Mecca. In the Haram months, they're not supposed to engage in battle, the Muslims are not supposed to initiate a fight. The believers went there, they were spying basically, in simple words, on the mushrikeen to see what they're doing to give that intelligence to the Holy Prophet. They were not supposed to engage in battle. In the Haram months, which we're supposed to respect and not initiate a battle, these believers saw some of the mushrikeen. They were trying to get intelligence. The mushrikeen saw them. They started going towards Mecca. These believers didn't have instructions to fight. They weren't supposed to fight. They had a little session. They were trying to decide what their responsibility is. So they thought, okay, Haram month, we're not supposed to do that. But on the other hand, if these guys go to Mecca and give the news that... Uh, the Holy Prophet has people looking out for them. Okay, that's going, to be diff that's going to be problematic for the believers. So, they went and fought them. One of them got killed. A couple other people went to Medina. They, they took them as captives to Medina. They arrived in Medina. News got to Mecca. The Meccans started to make this a propaganda against the believers. Oh, this is not really the Prophet of God. Why? Because he disobeyed one of the laws of God, which is that you have these haram and respectful months. You cannot initiate a fight. And he did. Okay. Verse was revealed in Surah Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billah min shaytan al-rajim. Yas'alunaka anil shahr al-haram qital fih. The believers, that propaganda started affecting the believers. The believers asked the question, and they were asking the question. Yas'alunaka anil shahr al-haram qital fih. What's Islam's view on Ashhur al Hurum, the Haram months? There's four months in the year that are considered Haram. In other words, they have special respect. We cannot initiate a battle in them. Then it continues and it responds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul qitalun fihi kabir. Fighting is really bad in this month. However, وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ A few things, I don't have all the words rem remembered and memorized in my mind. It says a few things, these are worse. And, it's, and then it says وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرْ مِنَ الْقَتْلِ This is the important It says fitna is worse than qatl. You look at the tafasir, what is meant by fitna? Well, the previous words, the first one that I did read to you. Saddun an sabilillah. So saddun an sabilillah is akbar min al qatl. Preventing people to have proper information about divine teachings. Giving them misinformation and creating Islamophobia. This is worse oppression than killing them. These are oppressions that are happening. We have a responsibility in regards to that as well. We have a responsibility, instead of keeping ourselves isolated, okay, and trying to preserve the little that we have, you need to start looking outward. Let's remove this oppression. Let's see what we can do to start this movement. And then when the Imam of the time comes, then that can expand. That's definitely a very important responsibility that we have.
Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wassalam. I once heard Okay, if I can read this properly. Maybe Sorry, the script is a little I'm not too What is that? I think if I understood the question properly is that the Imam uh, may come and a person is awaiting him and uh, he could completely miss him and how can we prevent that is that the question if the person is here that wrote the question now okay um, if I understood the question correctly and awaiting we're saying that awaiting for the coming of the Imam has to be defined correctly Okay, awaiting the coming isn't that we know about this concept of the coming of the Imam and I'm just, you know, doing certain things about my religion and I consider myself uh, awaiting for the coming of the Imam. No. The Imams have said, you need to be doing what your previous Imams have taught you. That means learn about your religion, that means practice it at the, so at the personal individual level correctly in your families and the social political responsibilities. All of that is part of the package. If we are doing that and we pray for the coming of the Imam, that's what we are considered, you know, awaiting the coming of the Imam. And then, inshallah, if we're actually practicing, when the Imam comes, we may even be one of the 313. Inshallah. One question I have is about, you know, coming back to that conversation with our Imam part time. You know, we have some people who are very good speakers, but they don't have the relatives very commercial. They will sign a contract that says they're going to charge a thousand dollars an hour and be the first class flight. What do you say about getting religion from people who may be excellent orators and you know, we don't know anything bad about them, but this is what we do know about them in terms of their turning the speaking, sort of being on the speaking circuit type of thing and being, making it very commercial and, and signing up contracts and being involved in that as well. I'll word the question because I have to repeat the question. I'll word it in my own way. Okay. Is there anything wrong with uh, people wanting to teach Islam to others and requesting for money and signing contracts and sometimes making that uh, you know pretty large bills okay and requesting that is there anything wrong with that well a couple of things first of all we have hadith that some of the ulama of the akhir zaman are going to be like that that's something we've already been told okay. and that was the problem that one of the problems that the ulama of Bani Israel had okay, that caused them to want to change that that influence that they had it, they wanted to the, it had come through illegitimate means there's a chapter in Al-Kafi it's called Babu if I remember the words correctly Al-Musta'kil Bi'ilmih the ones who are seeking to well, literally, it means seek to eat from. In other words, you gain money through knowledge that you have. And that has been looked down upon and condemned. For people to go around and ask for money, especially if, God forbid, it's large sums of money. So that's part of your question. That Islamically is looked down upon. I don't want to say there's a verdict that says it's haram. If you ask a marja, if, is it haram for someone to say, if I want to come and speak, I'm going to charge you $1,000 or $2,000 per 45 minutes? Okay. Then uh, they're probably going to tell you that it's not haram. But I'm saying that it's discouraged. Okay. It's not something that is encouraged. And the other thing is uh, about listening to people. 
Okay. I'll leave it to you. We have to get our information from reliable sources. We have to get our information from people who have studied the sources. What are the sources? Quran and Hadith. Somebody has got to go and learn how to understand Quran and Hadith or go and study under people who have learned that and at least get their information and say, okay, this is not my word. I'm being humble here. I can't really understand Quran and Hadith to an extent for me to come and say, this is what Hadith says. This is what the verse says. At least I'll come and tell you, okay, this is a uh, uh, Grand Ayatollah. He studied for this many years. He has the qualification. He is a mujtahid, for example. He is a philosopher. He is a mutakallam. He is this, he is that. And this is what he has to say. It is, either has to be from such a source or it has to be directly from Quran and Hadith. If a person does not have that qualification, how can we trust that? How can we get information about Islam from them? Well, sometimes we don't have any other option. Okay, but we got to take everything with a grain of salt. We got to make sure that we check the sources. If anything is dubious, anything, as that was a previous question that we have, anything that we had not heard before, check, from, check, uh, check reliable sources and see if that is uh, a reliable piece of information or not. <laughs> Don't make it personal there. <laughs> Well, Islamically, we've been told that that's not a career. That's what we're saying. Islam says, look, if you want to study, if, if I want to go over the hadith, the hadith say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, there's a number of hadith. In Al-Kafi, there's a chapter called Kitabu Fadl al-Ilm. Okay. It talks about the nobility and uh, the value of knowledge, the seekers of knowledge, how great it is to go and refer to the Ahlul Bayt, refer to hadith, and so on and so forth. All right. Part of those ahadith say the following. It says that if, it's not one of those bottled waters that is <laughs> oppression, right? No. Inshallah. Okay. okay. Um, it says that if a person dedicates their life for learning Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide sustenance uh, from, uh, will bring it from the heavens for him. Okay. In other words, he's going to do it in his way. Right? There's a difference. First of all, we've got to get this straight. Look, always the person who gives us sustenance is God. It's not our employer. It's not our knowledge. It's not our work. He provides the sustenance. Okay. How much you're going to get, it's exactly known. Exactly. Right? It's planned for, for beforehand. Plenty of hadith on that. It's Allah that gives you the rizq. All right? Now, He gives it in different ways. Some, if you choose your career to be something other than this, if we can call it a career, then it's going to be, I mean, you do have, we have these responsibilities, right? We have to go, if we are a physician, we got to go take care of people and we can ask for money. When it comes to the responsibility of learning to train others, it is a responsibility. But because of the dangers of the ulama becoming dependent on the dunya, and asking for the people to pay for them and then that leading to them becoming dependent on the money of the people and then changing what Islam says because they're not going to get it because some people are going to be like could you change that law right there you're going to get a bigger paycheck that will happen all right it has happened it is happening the pulpits are being censored why because they're afraid they're not going to be invited again all right it's because of this culture that has developed because of that, Islam says, look, this is not a career. I'll provide it through other means. Don't ask the people that you teach to give you money. Okay? I'll provide it some other way for you. And the ulama say, I'm not an alim. I can't claim to be an alim. I, I can just claim to be a student. But the ulama say that we've experienced it and we've seen them experience that We've seen their lives. And you see it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done that for them. Okay? But going and asking, look, they call you up to be invited So, okay, what's the hadiyah going to be? We call it hadiyah, but it's not really a hadiyah, it's, it's a must, you have to give it. What kind of a hadiyah is that? Hadiyah means a gift. What kind of a gift is that? You decide beforehand, okay, let me write up the bill. It's uh, 10 sessions here and two Q&As and this, that, the other, and it's okay, $50,000. That's a joke, man, that's not a hadiyah. Okay. 
No, Islam tells us that when it comes to this field, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to provide. Don't ever fear that. And He does. But when you go out, don't tell people to give you money. Yes? It's a good question. The sister's asking, okay, how am I going to be able to judge whether I am moving in the right direction towards the Imam or I'm not? How can I say, how can I uh, know whether I'm going to be of those that's going to reject the Imam or accept him? Okay. Well, first of all, we're told that uh, about the future and what's going to happen to us, we, we have to be in the state of khawf and raja. Have hope in Allah, but lose hope in ourselves. Okay. Have fear of what I am going to do, and because of that fear of God, but have hope in Allah that He's going to guide. All right? And don't think, oh, it's guaranteed, oh, Alhamdulillah, I've done this, then inshallah I'm going to be with the Imam. No, there's no guarantee. All right? The guarantee is every second. You've got to see what you're doing on a, uh, on a daily basis. You've got to keep yourself in check. All right? But what is it that we need to look for? We've got to be, first of all, honest with ourselves first. God forbid if we start being dishonest with ourselves. Okay. And what we need to judge is, okay, am I gaining more knowledge about Islam or not? And when I'm gaining, am I putting that in practice or not? That's a very important question to ask. Are we actually putting it into practice? Are we even aware of what we are doing? Are we even keeping a check on ourselves? Or do months pass by and then some speaker comes and says something and I look back like, oh my God, actually, you know what? I've been backbiting, slander, I didn't pay my khums, I didn't do this, I didn't pray on time, all of this, and I'm negligent. Thank you. Okay. Negligence is the worst disease that can come upon us. Being careless of what we do. Not worrying about it. The worst disease. Nothing is as bad as that. Okay. If we don't have negligence, if we're keeping a check, the ulama say, Imam Khomeini in Shal Hadith says, every day when you wake up, make a pledge between yourself and God. I'm not going to commit sins today. At the end of the day, check. Did I commit any or not? During the day, keep a check on myself. Make sure. It shouldn't be, brothers and sisters, a lot of times we get all comfy. And then we just talk and talk and talk and talk and afterwards we start thinking about it. Oh my God, was that back, backbiting? Was that slander? Was that this? Did I lie there? Think, then act. Don't act, then think. Okay. It's called muraqaba. So anything, any step you want to take, anywhere you want to go, ask Allah for help in, early in the morning. Allah, help me out with this. Think before you do it. Is this allowed or not? Is this an obligation or not? Make sure you're doing what you need to do. Make sure you're refraining from whatever you need to refrain. Beyond that, you have the liberty of enjoying your time within the boundaries of Islam. Make sure you always have a check on yourself. And then, at the end of the day, again, look back at the results and see what you've done. If you've been able to fulfill responsibilities, thank Allah because He made it possible. If you had shortcomings, ask for forgiveness and istighfar. And ask Allah to help you not to do it. If we have these checks and balances, making sure our knowledge of Islam is growing, making sure we're putting it into practice. Then we can be hopeful, have that raja, because there's no guarantee. See, remember, if you're looking for a guarantee, there's no guarantee. You can have hope, serious ones. And you can know that that direction is the right direction. And you're moving in that direction. But you can have only have hopes that inshallah you will be with the Imam when he comes. Really? Okay. I'll take, uh, if sisters have any question, I'll take one from the sisters and there's one brother up here.
Uh, well, after that, and we'll, what is that? Okay, inshallah. Yes? Okay, so I've heard from some sources that the same way the occultation of the Baraman happened in two stages, that his return will happen in two stages as well, and that we are already present in the first stage of his return. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what are the signs for this? And what can we do to try and recognize these two stages of his return? If we're in it or if we're not. Okay, the words that just came out and I heard, I think I know who you're talking about and what they've said, okay? But, uh, let me try to expand on it a little bit. The brother is saying, okay, there was two stages in the occultation of the Imam. The initial stage was called al ghaybat al-Sughra, we call it, it's just a term we use. We call it the minor occultation, because although he was away from the people, but he did have direct contact with certain people. He had four main people that he contacted others through and he had letters that went around letters went around to a lot of different people they're called tawqiat okay the tawqis of the imam of, of our time that en that ended in the year 329 okay it started in two, uh, 260 ended 329 that's when the major occultation began all right so 40 plus 29 69 years all right they say that the return of the Imam is going to be in stages as well. This is what the brother says he has heard. What does that mean and how can we, what, what are the signs of that? How can we help out maybe in my words? It depends what that, what is intended from that. If what is being intended is that the same way that during the minor occultation at the beginning, there were people that were in contact with the Imam that would have letters going around. That's not true. Okay. Until the return of the Imam If anybody says I'm the representative of the Imam Here's a letter, this is what you have to do No I know people that are paying like 50,000 pounds Per head To certain people who are claiming to be One of the companions of the Imam currently okay. In the UK and in California This is happening right now okay. That's baloney no, we don't have such a thing. Until the coming of the Imam, no one can claim, I am his direct rep representative, and here are his instructions for you. you got to pay me this much. No, that's not true. But if what they mean is that the process of getting the people ready for occultation didn't even start with the Imam himself. It started with the previous Imams. The Prophet talks about the occultation of the Imam of our time. Amirul Mu'mineen. The hadith is, one day he was sitting on the floor, on the ground, on the earth. There was dirt, in other words, it wasn't like on a rug or anything. And he was playing around, the hadith says, with the dirt that was there. And the person comes and asks him, what are you thinking about? The Imam says, I'm thinking about my son that will be the savior of mankind. Any opportunity they get, they're talking about it. From the time of the Prophet, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Hussein, Imam al-Mujtaba, all the way until the end. It intensifies during the time of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Baqir, Salamullah alayhi wa They start training students and they start making people rely on the students instead of themselves. They're very, they, this is, these are our Imams, okay? They planned this out. They started putting more reliance on the scholars. Look, don't ask me, go and ask Zurara. Go ask this companion, go ask that companion. Okay, training them. People coming and asking, who can we ask? They supported these ulama that they trained. The pious, knowledgeable ulama at that time. Then they started this system called the Wakala system. Beyond just asking questions, they actually had responsibilities. Representatives that took care of the affairs, khums collection, zakat, okay, um, the questions and answers, any letter that wants to go, representation, anything that wants to come to the imam, to the people, it goes through these people. These are the representatives, wikala, the wakala. <coughs> they increased that until during the time of the last Imam before the Imam of Ram, the 11th Imam, Imam al Askari, what he used to do, people actually traveled great distances to come and meet the Imam in Samirra. 
he would send a representative, he does two things, two things at the same time. One is, he sends a representative in the story that I'm talking about. Before they arrive to Samirra, tells them, turn back, go to my representative in your city. With this, he's done two things. One, emphasize the knowledge of the unseen of the Imams, which was questionable at that time by the Shias. They didn't really have strong faith in that. Two, giving support to the ulama. Instead of them coming to the Imam, he wants to say, no, 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 you got to start getting used to asking these guys. Don't come and ask directly. Another example, they would come to the Imam, they would even come to his house, he would speak to them behind a curtain, he wouldn't show his face. They're there, but he wants to get them used to not seeing their Imam. Okay. Then he started supporting one particular representative he had, the Amri, which they say the, the Alim in Medina that was the leader of the Shia out, out there is one of the you know, great great grandchildren of Al Amri. Uh, he was talked about all the time and the Imam emphasized that whatever he says is whatever I say. So many times so people get that trust. He became the first representative of the Imam of our time. And that's how the, the preparation, they prepared the masses of the Shia. Otherwise they would have denied it. Like what happened here? You wouldn't have something called Shia anymore. They prepared, it was a gradual process, all right? The process of the coming of the Imam is also going to be gradual. Because, and we are, we've already kind of explained this, it's not like everything's going to be going bad in the wrong direction, everybody's becoming worse and worse and worse. Everybody, all the world population is becoming bad people, and then all of a sudden, just things happen. No. It's going to be a gradual process. People are going to start turning towards the right direction, but the oppressors are going to be oppressing them, and these people need to rise up and become more aware. That's when the Imam is going to come. If this is what they mean, yes, this is something that uh, you, see, you, you find traces of that in the hadith. Logic and reason proves this. And one of the parts of that, the, one of the hadith that I can give for that is, as I said, the Imam said, practice what you're taught by the previous Imams. That practice includes social practices, standing up to injustices, and that itself creates and prepares the ground. Or including that idea, the Islamic government, which we said is a genuine Islamic concept and ideology rooted in the Quran and in Hadith. When you get the chance, when Imam Khomeini got it, he did this. When you get the chance, you got to do that. This is all part of the gradual process of the people of the world being ready for the coming of the Imam. What do we need to do? We need to join the game. Start learning more, start practicing more. That's what we need to do. Okay, yeah, go ahead, sister. Okay, uh, the last bit, uh, he spent a few minutes on Musiba. is that what was said? Okay. Uh, sister is, is asking, and I think there's a comment within the question, and that is that uh, when we ask scholars, when we ask the ulama for guidance, we're looking for what we consider guidance. We're looking for what sounds good to us, what pleases us. If they tell us something that we don't like, then we don't want to accept it. Okay. Example given, Masaib are recited by an alim and it's frowned upon. Uh, what can I say? People, yeah, uh, do I need to condemn that? Is, is that something that, that's what the people did to the Imams? Okay, and that's what the people are doing to the students of the Imams. We have to get this out of our head. We can't accept Islam the way we want it. To be. We have to accept Islam the way it is. And that's why it's called Islam. Okay, submission. <laughs> that's what the word means for God's sake. Alright. Not that I have this image. This is what I know of it. This is what I'm comfortable with. And everybody else better match this. Otherwise, that's not what I believe in. Okay. And this is a serious issue. Now, there's plenty of other examples that I can think of. But... I think we have to start get going, the brother that needs to take me back. It was a pleasure to be amongst uh, brothers and sisters here. I hope what was said, uh, Allah uh, accepts. If there's any flaws and shortcomings on my behalf, inshallah Allah forgives and corrects that information for you, inshallah. 
pray for me. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, pro, uh, to hasten the return of our Imam. We ask him to enable us to become his true companions and soldiers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong the life of him, give good health to all of our maraja and especially the leader. We ask him to forgive us all of our sins on these nights of uh, the month of Ramadan, the remaining ones. We ask him to relieve all the people of the world, especially the believers of the oppressions that they are facing. And we ask him to relieve all the people of the world that are under hardship, especially the believers and especially the believers, brothers and sisters in Somalia. And a practical prayer for all of us here. We are responsible for those brothers and sisters in Somalia. Whatever we can give, whatever we can do, it is a wajib responsibility. It's not even a mustahab one. People are dying. If I could have saved one and I didn't, that's my responsibility. I have to answer on the day of judgment. So let's try to fulfill that, inshallah. Recite a salam. There's a request of doing one of the du'as of Faraj, which is a very good idea. I just need to know what Qibla is this way, right? This way. Right? Okay. That doesn't need to be recorded, does it? Okay.